with them. All right, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to go ahead and read this, and then we are going to dive right in. Uh, but I want us to remember that last week, where we came from was, um, it was part one of a two-part series in Jesus Must Be the Center of Your Home. <clears throat> That's what we talked about last week, and we talked specifically about wives and husbands, uh, and what that looks like in God's plan, God's design for the home as far as that relationship goes. Um, so you guys missed it. You were gone on the day after you got married. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We, uh, we talked about this stuff. Uh, so we talked about that, how th th this, is, this is, Jesus must be the center of your home. Uh, it doesn't take too, too much to look around and see the society, the culture we live in, and, and the um, fragility with which uh, marriage is is held and, and how uh, marriage is uh, is more and more becoming more and more compromised and uh, so it is just a, absolutely essential for the wife and the husband to uh, give themselves to Jesus and for Jesus to be the center of their homes and, and, and so he starts there with wives and husbands and he's going to continue on here in chapter six to now children, he's going to introduce children into this, this uh, equation. And, and while parents are, are, are now, it's not wives and husbands, it's like you've, you've progressed, you've had children now. So now we're talking about uh, parents of children. And then he's going to talk about slaves and masters. Uh, and keeping in mind that that's all the home life. Okay, So when you hear slaves, that's, that's in the home. Uh, so this is part two of Jesus must be central to the home. All right, Jesus must be central to the home. And we ended it last, last week saying, none of that from last week is going to make sense until you fall on your face before Jesus. None of that is going to make sense until Christ has all of your heart. Uh, it, it, it's going to be very difficult for you to put yourself into God's design when, when God's not at the forefront of it, when God's not where he belongs to begin with. All right, so part two, Ephesians 6, 1 through 9, of Jesus must be central to our homes. Let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 9. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Masters, do the same to them. Stop your threatening, knowing that he is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. <clears throat> so you guys see here, as, is, as this chapter starts off, it's going to immediately talk about children and parents. And let's let our minds wander a little bit to uh, maybe some, some friends of ours or some temptations of your own uh, to that dad who uh, was just too busy. Maybe, maybe that was your dad, uh, but the dad, the dad that just had no time for his kids. He was a slave to his cell phone. He was a slave to the office. This dad was just never there. And, and, and you know, sometimes the motives in that dad, though, they aren't always wrong. You know, so he wants to provide for his family. He wants to offer them a home that they can, they can be raised in comfortably and, and, and have everything that they need, and even some of their desires and their wants at times. So it doesn't mean that the motives are necessarily, you know, polluted. But when it comes to Scripture, that's, that's fulfilling one command and providing for them. But we cannot do that to the neglect of another command, which is raising them, all right? which is training up your children. And that takes time. That takes sacrifice. That say, takes saying no to things that are going to crowd out your schedule for, for family, for your children. And the terrible situation, that terrible situation leads to children that are just broken apart. And, and you guys, as, as our minds are kind of wandering to, to that guy, to that dad, 
those parents that are just too busy with their career. And, and, and maybe you know that they, they love their children and above everything else, but their schedule doesn't say that. The, the, the way they spend their time doesn't say that. All right, so, so as we wander, think about the children. I smoked marijuana the first time with a child whose family was falling apart. The very first time. He was the one who introduced me the last time, too. Don't be wrong. <laughs> uh, but, but that was the first time I did that. Was was a child whose dad had no time for him. No time for him. He, this is, his, his family is actually now broken. He is remarried. His, his second wife has died. He's the most miserable man I have ever seen. <clears throat> we don't have to go too far to see this. And I want us to understand that what's at stake here, parents, dads, moms, future parents, and future moms, what's at stake here is the lives of our children. And the reputation of Jesus as children who are raised in a Christian home. Alright, so last week we talked about the importance of Jesus being the center of our home. That's the same this week, alright? This is part two, like I said. And I, and I think that Ephesians 4, Ephesians 6, 1 through 9 gives us four characteristics of the biblical household that will cause our home to be a light in a dark world. Alright, so that's where we're going today. I want us to see four characteristics of the biblical household that's going to cause our home to shine in a dark world. All right, so, so Paul's going to walk us through this. I think the first one that we see here is that the biblical home is characterized by respectful children. The second thing that we're going to talk about is the biblical home is characterized by dedicated parents. We're going to, talk, we're going to unpack all of this. The, the third characterization is uh, the biblical home is characterized by selfless Serving, and the last one is it's it's characterized by humble leadership. All right, so none of this is going to blow you away, but this is just straight from Bible, and this is what we see God's design for the home. Okay, so the first thing is the biblical home is characterized by respectful children. You guys see that? That's the very first couple words there. Children, obey your parents. Children, listen. Children, hearken. Children, align yourself with your parents. Children, subject yourselves to your parents. I've only got a couple children in the room. And, and so th that's, that's, that's good for us to differentiate as we walk into this. When he talks about children, technon, he's actually talking about uh, those children that are old enough to understand. All right? They're old enough to understand obedience. They're old enough to understand honor. But he's talking about people that are actually young enough where they're actually still under their parents' roof. They're under their parents' uh, influence. Uh, they're, they're under their parents' authority still. So they're not out of the house. I think in our culture that, 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 that parallels fairly well. Uh, they're still under their parents. Uh, so this is what he's talking about. Those types of children, this is their primary response. For children growing up, they obey. It's obedience. It's this God-given framework that he places children in. They are subject to parents. And he's obviously referring to both mom and dad here, all right? So uh, he's, uh, he's referring to children obey both your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And when he says this, in the Lord, he's not talking about parents that are in the Lord. I don't think he's talking about Christian parents, right? You know, remember last week when we were talking about wives and husbands, and it was still the responsibility of the husband to love his wife. It's still the responsibility of the wife to submit to her husband, regardless of her, his spiritual state. Because in doing that, you are actually giving honor to the ultimate, to God. All right? So in, in, in loving and in submitting, you, are, you are, are, like we said last week, you are actually going through the spouse and to God. You're showing God, you are my king. You direct my paths. All right? And so it's the same thing here for, for the children. It says, obey your parents in the Lord. It's the same idea here where, where the children are, are they're going to, and this is going to, we're going to talk about this in a second, how this happens, where the parents are, are dedicating themselves to training and discipling their own children so they, they know this truth. They're responsible for this information here. And they, they love Jesus themselves as children and submit to Jesus. They obey because in obeying their parents, it's actually obeying God. All right? It's being pulled through their parents, and they are giving, they're giving, they're, they're worshiping Christ in this act. This is right. He says, this is just, this is right. This is what children do. This is fitting. This is appropriate. This is, this is what makes sense if you are a Christian child under the influence and authority of your parents. 
Right? This is just what those children do. They, they obey, and then it goes on to say they honor. In verse 2, honor your father and mother. Children obey, and now children honor. This is their two-pronged uh, set of, of, this is your go-to. This is the responsibilities of children. They honor their father and mother. They obey their father and mother. And Paul is really cool. He, he brings out this, this parenthetical phrase here. He says, this is the first commandment with promise. And there's debate about what exactly that means, other than this is referring most likely to back in Genesis. Uh, and he's taking from Genesis, and, he, and he's, he's about to quote directly from uh, Genesis chapter 2 in, in, in verse 3. Uh, but, but he's looking back to the Old Testament, and, and he's, 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 he's saying, you know, when children are growing up, the simplest way to honor their parents is by obeying them. All right? Now, parents aren't, aren't to obey their parents forever, right? They, but they are to honor them forever. And the way you honor your parents outside of the home, I think, and this is going to be more towards us, where most of us are at right now, uh, since, since we're not under the command, we're not under the, they're not paying my bills anymore, the, my parents aren't, I, I'm not living in their house, how then do I honor? And as my responsibility to them goes from obeying to now having my own family where we have left and cleft, and I now I honor. And that command sticks with me for life. And so I think we can honor them in at least three ways. <clears throat> I think the, the first way we can honor parents is, is by representing them well. Representing them well in conversation, representing them well as to uh, how they uh, how they succeeded in in, in, the, in raising you and in, in, in conversations about your parents. You're not throwing them under the bus. You're not bringing out all the things you always disagreed with and how horrible your upbringing was. But you are trying to represent them well. You you are trying to show kindness in in the way you cast their reputation towards people. So I think we can honor them in that way. I think we also honor our parents by giving tribute to them, uh, by, by praising them for the ways that, that in raising you, they, they did well, and in the, ways, in, in, in the positive ways they impacted you. So giving tribute to your, your parents is a way of honoring them, and then obviously you can care for them. And I think that's a third way that we can, uh, we can show honor to our parents. You care for them, so you, you, you are with them, you, you, you spend time with them, you, you pray with them and for them, and you just help them. And as they get older in years, you, you make yourself available. Doesn't mean you have to pick up everything and move in with them or vice versa. That might be what it means. But a way that you can honor them is by caring for them. And so I guess as I view our, our, the people that are listening to this and, and how most of us are not children, uh, I, the command that sticks with us is honoring them. And I think those are ways that we can do that. So let's honor our parents. At one time, we were children. <clears throat> and then he goes in verse 3. He mentions this. Uh, I'm going to say a proverb uh, from the Old Testament, that it may go well with you, speaking of children, and that you may live long in the land. That it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Man, some people might look at that and be like, you know, a child, like, I better do right. Like, I better obey. I better honor. I better, like, I, because I really, really, really want things to go well. And, and I really want to live long. I want to have a long life. I want to have, you know, I want to have almost 100 years tacked on to my name. Well, that's why I said this is a proverb and not a promise, all right? So this is, uh, this is something that, that has, definitely has this proverbial overtone to it. It's referring to, yeah, yeah it's referring to the children of Israel because he's quoting from the Old Testament. Uh, and, and he's bringing out some highlights to the context of that, this verse in the Old Testament where God prospered and protected the children of Israel when they were humbly submitting themselves to him. All right, so the more that they were in line with God's plan for them, he, he would reward them, in a sense. He would give them blessing. And, and, in a, and, and it didn't directly correspond to their obedience and their humility, but it was really close. And so the more that they, they lined themselves up with, with God and gave their hearts and, and submitted to Him, He would reward them, and things went well. You know, they prospered over their enemies, right? They, uh, they, they, they won battles. Their, their wealth was accruing, uh, and, and this was God. And, and, and so when they did the opposite of that, I think God, being a gracious God, allowed them to be the ones that were overtaken by their enemies. So, so just, this is just a proverb where it's saying, you know, th this isn't a promise, but this is, you know, if you, the, the general trajectory of your life 
It, it, it is going to go upwards and, and more and more to God. And you are going to submit more and more yourself in every cavity of your heart to Him. And, and you are positioning yourself for blessing. You are positioning yourself for God to work. For things to go well with you. And this is children in view here. So children who have obeyed and honored their parents, they're more likely as well to lead these disciplined lives. And it's kind of like the natural odds are for a balanced and a long life. Does that make sense? So this is where Paul is talking about children. And this is a biblical hope. Where, where your children, to, to mom, they rise up and call her blessed. Because they see mom walk with God. Where they, they've caught her reading her Bible. They've caught her in prayer. They've caught her on her knees. And, and, and it's just logical, just makes sense for them to want to replicate that. Because it's the real deal coming from mom and dad. They rise up and they, they call her blessed. This, is, this makes sense in a biblical home for the children to respectfully, in, in, in an honoring way, love and obey their parents. So this is, this is a staple. This is a staple of the biblical home, of the Christian household. And the Christian household that has Jesus at the center, that's Jesus that's central, this is going to be a natural outflow. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you're going to have perfect children. That doesn't mean that all of them are going to grow up and, and, and you know, there's going to be this, this five out of five success rate. Uh, that, that's not a promise like we're talking about here, but this is the plan and this is design. And, and, and obviously we're working in a fallen world. We're working in a, in a world where, where we're broken and where sin's a thing and where sin is a powerful thing. And it has the, the power to, to grip even our children. I know at times in my own life where sin gripped me and pulled me uh, from, from out from under the submission of my parents and, and, and numerous occasions of uh, God. But this is the first staple, the first characterization of biblical home, guys. It's, it's children. It's respectful, obedient children. So where do parents fit in then? All right, let's talk a little bit about the parents. And then verse 4, it, 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 it talks to parents. And it does have a broader scope of father and mother, but it's going to particularly hone in on dad, all right? So these are the ones who are entrusted with the leadership of their homes. A couple verses earlier, Paul just said that the father is the, 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 the husband is the head of the home. Remember that? And we talked a little bit about how that was a pushback against that society and, and how they had this thing called patria postestis. You guys remember this from last week? Where this is the idea that father, the father had absolute control over their children in Roman law. So in the first century, a father could, uh, could just dictate everything and everything that he wanted for his child all the way through this his teen years and if he had a daughter he could even dictate into her marriage and the father could dip into her marriage and even give the husband uh, a divorce from the dad all right so this is crazy and so when Paul shows up and, and points out you know what this is now this is, this is you parents this is you fathers in particular you abandon that system are you this is not Patria Postestis anymore all right, this is the Christ-centered home. And this is what it's going to look like. So he's going to unpack that a little bit. And the first thing he mentions is, in a Christian home, the Christian way, the new you, you don't provoke your children. <clears throat> Man, I didn't have to think long and hard about this. Uh, my kid's the only one. He's like saying five words. But I've already provoked the poor kid. And it's kind of funny <clears throat> because it's helpless, you know, right now. It's, it's innocent, you know. I love it when he's, he's crawling in front of me and I'll trip his knees. And I know, I know, it's terrible. And, and I'll pull him back, and he'll try to crawl away, and I'll pull him back again, and he'll try to crawl. And it, it starts off laughter, thinking like, oh, this is great, Dad. And then it just turns into anger, you know? And, and he's just crying before I know it, three or four, like, leg chops later. Poor guy. It's just, he's, he's harmed. He's injured. It, this is me provoking my child. This, this, this is a very, very small illustration of that. But this is just, I think this is, this is common in living in that broken world that we talked about, I think it's common for people to want to conjure up a, a, a reaction from people and where, where we, want to, we want to kindle this, this little thing into something big. And there's this twisted way that we see enjoyment in that at times, where, where it's a way that we view ourselves as exercising control. Like, oh, look how much influence I have. I can make my child so mad. Watch this. <clears throat> And this is what Paul's saying. You've got to drop that idea of provoke there. Is, uh, it means kindle into flame. And it can, it can be positive or negative. 
you know, in a negative sense, you can, you can, you can uh, sense a spark of frustration in someone, and you can say things to, to fan that spark into this bonfire, right? Some of this is, your, this is your tendency. I'm talking to you, where you know just the right words. Oh, man, you guys have been married a long time, and you know what will just set them off like that. This is, this is directed at you. We don't provoke. And fathers, especially when it comes to your children, we don't provoke your children into to just blowing, flying off the handle. And yeah, in the first century, you know, the, the father had incentive to do that to his children. The father had, had a motive, because if he wanted his kid to do more for him, or if he didn't like his child, and he wanted to imprison the kid, he could do that. He could provoke him to mess up, and then dad goes, ha, caught you, you're going to jail. He could literally do that because of the Roman law. He had complete and absolute authority over his, over his, his kids, where he could, if he wanted to, he could do just that. He could imprison him, he could scourge him, he could enslave him to someone else. He could even murder his own child, and the, the Romans would think that's all right. So that's kind of a negative sense. But then in a positive sense, you can also provoke someone. And we hear this in Scripture too, right? Where we are to provoke one another to love and good works. That's a positive example of that, where we are to provoke. That's the idea of keeping in line with my one-year-old. He's being terrible this morning. Keeping in line with him. If, if I'm like playing and I'm tickling him on the floor and we're running around and we're playing games and I'm provoking him to hysterical laughter. And that is a positive outflow of provoking. That is a, a great way to utilize your authority. But Paul is especially honing in on this father-child dynamic. Because a child that feels belittled is destroyed, right? A child that feels like they have no freedom, that they have no way to express themselves at home, that, they have, that they're, they're just under dad and mom's thumb, they can't do anything, that they, they, they're, they're squashing them. <clears throat> There's got to be a way where we can take that same idea of provoking and do it in a positive way, where we're provoking their skill sets, where we're provoking them to love. We're provoking them to, to explore maybe where the, the, the lane in which God wants them to run. You're, you're helping them find where God has, has, has honed and find to their minds for, for what they're going to spend the rest of their lives. And you're provoking them towards the cross. That's redeeming the negative example of provoking your children. But fathers, we just don't do this. <clears throat> And this is Paul. Yeah, he's, he's pushing back against the culture there, but it's totally relevant to us today. <clears throat> we just don't do it. We don't provoke our kids. We don't intentionally get under their skin. We don't push them to say and do stupid things. We don't push them to rebellion. <clears throat> Have you guys ever done that? If that's the case, <clears throat> there's grace. There's forgiveness. <clears throat> And you can turn from that and be the father and the parent that God wants you to be. <clears throat> but what I, what I want us to check out here too, all right? So as far as is uh, the biblical home characterized by dedicated parents, all right? We, we saw first that dedicated parents, they, they're not provoking their kids to wrath, but they are on mission for God. This is what I want to see, and this is what we, we, we're going to pull out here from verse 4. So the first half of verse 4. Don't provoke your children. Negative. Bad. No, no. Don't do that. All right? But what we're going to do is we're going to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And this is where I get my point that the biblical home is characterized by dedicated parents. Well, that begs the question, what are we dedicated to? What are we, what, what, what's going on here? All right, well, godly parents are going to be dedicated to raising their children in plain sight of the love of God. All right? Dedicated parents are going to raise their children in plain sight of the gospel. Mom and dad are going to mess up, but mom and dad are going to get grace, and we are going to forgive, and we are going to move on. D dedicated parents, guys, are on mission. And here it is. Two things. Discipline and instruction of the Lord. Discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is what parents are committing to. All right, this is the mission of the biblical parent. It's those two things. All right, so that, that word there, discipline, uh, some people, they, 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 these are actually kind of two synonyms, discipline and instruction. 
uh, they, they bring out different aspects of each other. For one, the, the, the discipline, the, that means like training, that side of things, seems to highlight the activity of educating children. And the, the instruction, the admonition, that seems to be the, uh, the educating, right? That's the giving of the instruction. So there's two sides to that, where there's the activity of it and there's the giving of it, okay? And so and Paul has both in view. And actually, this, this, uh, this word admonition, this, this word instruction, that's the same word for which we get newthetic, newthesia. That's where we get newthetic counseling, if you've heard of that. Biblical counseling. So, so right here, Paul is telling us to commit to, to training and, and admonishing and counseling our children to rear them up in these two things, which are the Lord's. All right, so um, <clears throat> that word, nuthesia, that word admonition, instruction, uh, one theologian, Harold Hunter, says this. It denotes the word of admonition that's designed to correct while not provoking or embittering. The word signifies the gentlest sort of instruction in conduct, free from rebuke or reprimand and characterized by timely suggestions rather than sharp imperatives. Right, so that's the, that's in the built into that word is, is that all right where where parents are dedicating themselves, committing themselves to to coming alongside and counseling, warning, instructing, at times reproving their children in a way that doesn't send them off out the other end and says. I, I, I'm, I'm digging my heels in. I hate you, Dad. I want none of this. But in a way that doesn't embitter them, but in a way that, that provokes them to Christ. That's the mission. That, this, is, this is why th this has got to be a dedicated parent because that takes work. That takes effort. That takes sacrifice. That means letting go of some things. That may even be letting go of some of your hobbies that you used to love before you have kids in the evenings, going out to the garage or wherever you went and enjoying you time. That might mean getting rid of some of that and getting on your knees with your little goobers and making them laugh, right? Or that might mean you, you, go, take, you go take daughter on a date some night. That might mean you, you go play super weird games you've never played before like dolls and then act like you enjoy it. If this takes sacrifice. It takes letting go of yourself and, and investing all of you into your children. And that's why the godly home is going to be characterized by dedicated parents. Man, and when you have kids, and I'm new at this, all right, by no means professional, all right? I'm just, this is the next passage, and i got to do it. <laughs> uh, but what's going on here is when you have kids, everything changes, right? <clears throat> and I hear that and as you grow, as they grow, it, it just gets busier. And there's just kind of like more things that are, that are fine for your time and that are just trying to take this slot and this hour and these three hours and this ball game and, and this recital. And it just kind of gets more cluttered and more cluttered and it's going to get really more difficult. It's going to get very hard to carve out you time. But in a way, that's not just the super exclusive, weird homeschool family. Right, Paul? Amen? Amen. Paul homeschools his five, almost six children. And none of them are weird, you know? In a way that, that you homeschool your children. Okay, Max, no, I'm just kidding. So in, in a way that, that you are protecting them from, from the, the vices of sin. But at the same time, you're, you're, giving, you're putting them in community. Our soul needs this, right? As, as Christians, we, we need other people. We're doing this together. We're all group projects. And, and we're, we're raising our children in a way that doesn't embitter them. They don't run from the church. They run to Jesus. Where humility where grace are common terms around your house. You're on a mission, Mom and Dad. You're on a mission, and our children's lives are at stake. We can't be like that absent dad we talked about. My dad always said that ADD was absent dad disorder. And for the most part, I found that to be true. <clears throat> but we are doing this of the Lord, right? So we are bringing them up, we are rearing them, we are nurturing them, we are, we are loving and caring them up in, in this, this discipline, this training, and this instruction, this admonition. Whose is it, though? Of the Lord. This is the Lord. So, so now what's going on here is we're seeing that as the parents in this situation who's to pass on 
the, 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 is to disciple his own children. We're now seeing that, that actually I am just an agent through which God works. Where this is all for him and he is, what he is pouring to me, I am to pour through. And God is working through me. It's going to take time. It's going to take urgency. <clears throat> but that is going to take a personal walk with Jesus. You guys got to remember, this is, this is in the greater context of the latter half of chapter 5 and 6, where he's talking about spirit-filled believers. And I think a, a dad, a mom in this situation, in order to be the parent that God's calling you to be, it's going to take dependence on the spirit. So this is hard. It, it, this is going to be work. It's going to be all-out effort at times, most of the time. But it's possible through the spirit. You've got to put, position yourself in a way where God pours himself through you, and it comes out, it bleeds out of your family. Intentionally and unintentionally, formally and informally, where it comes through and works and changes our families from the ground up. And this is why I say that Jesus must be central to our home. And before that, Jesus must be central to you. Or this is, you're just going to be, where, where, you, where God is trying to pour out into you, and he's just going to have to reroute around you. He's going to have to reroute. He's saying, Ben, why, why, aren't you, why aren't you letting me work through you? Why aren't you passing this on? Man, we're, we're not in this for better morals. I don't want to raise Cade and, and future children and just, just make them moral good people. I want to raise them in a way that, that, that they have, they've seen and experienced someone who knows what it's like to walk with Jesus. And their life is drastically different if we took Jesus out of it. And I want to raise kids in a way that, that they are on fire for Christ. Where they, they, they're, they're empowered to stand in a world that, that hates God, that, that wants to grip them with sin, that wants to rip them apart at the core. I want to raise children that run to Jesus. And that is only going to come from you. As a parent, you've got to fall on your face before Jesus. This is hard, Paul. You can't fake it for too long. The third thing that characterizes a biblical home, I think, is selfless serving. And this is what we're going to see in verses 5 through 9. Uh, that talks about slaves and their masters. All right? So, uh, <clears throat> slaves and their masters. A quick side note about slavery. All right? Because this is kind of one of the it's not a buzzword, but it just has a negative connotation. So I want, I want us to bring us back again, just as we looked at Paul pushing against first century culture. We're gonna let's just step back into first century culture here as well, okay? So so slavery was entirely different from U.S. slavery, right? So we've got we just got to differentiate that from the outgo, from the outset. Um, it was so different. We're talking about two different things. Uh, color was not an issue, all right. And if you remember history, American history, that is, that's the big thing that tainted slavery, right? It, it, this, is, this is where there's this elite group that, 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 that's, that's utilizing, that's forcing some labor from a different subpar group, right? That is not first century. Color wasn't an issue. Slaves came from all ethnicities, backgrounds, from every different social rung they came, all right? So this is slavery then, where actually freed people, you could sell yourself into slavery knowing that you could later regain freedom again. All right? And actually, this was advantageous for some people. There was actually one king's son, a king's son, who didn't want to pay provincial taxes, so he became a slave. All right? So th this is what I'm saying. By all, across all social spectrums, people ens they could enslave themselves and be found slaves. There were just benefits to being a slave. You, you were provided food. You were given clothing. You were given shelter. You were taken care of when you were sick. That didn't always happen if you were free. All right? Uh, slavery of the first century was, was actually, um, you, you could become highly trained and educated. Uh, some actually, some slaves actually became well-known philosophers, they became physicians, they, they became professors. Uh, a normal job for them was actually being a tutor, because the slaves were the ones with the knowledge. All right, so th this, is, this is slavery, this is an everyday part of their lives. Uh, Epictetus, a well-known philosopher, was a slave. All right, uh, you could actually become free if you you wanted, and there are certain ways you could do that, and you could even become a Roman citizen. Uh, you weren't relegated to just this uh, no man's land of slavery. 
And there, obviously, there, there still is a, a dark side to that slavery in the first century. There was that, uh, where there was poor treatment of slaves. Uh, and there are numerous accounts of uh, rulers abusing that and, uh, you know, beating their slaves for dropping a cup of wine. Uh, they, they definitely uh, took advantage of, of people in that sense. But there's also a brighter side. <clears throat> Uh, and, and we just have to understand though, that this type of slavery didn't occur out of some hatred towards somebody's color of their skin. All right, this kind of slavery, uh, I, I think it came out of just the, it, it, the, the the bad use of slavery came out of an enjoyment of cruelty that I think is just natural to many people. Uh, so, anyways, I hope that helps us understand what we're talking about when we see slavery. All right, so when he says slaves in verse five. Um, we, we've just got to erase the image that we probably have from growing up in America and understand that this is just part of the inner workings of, of the economics of the day. Uh, we have to understand that this is, a, this is a viable way that people paid their bills and that people often subjected themselves. Now, obviously, we have to condemn the, the, the poor treatment of people. Yes. Uh, but that, that expands beyond just slavery. Uh, so we are, we're going we're gonna to categorically say we don't treat people bad and we're not for that, right? Uh, so that's, and that obviously happened, but, but Paul, and this is unique, this is really unique. Um, a lot of people say Paul, in Colossians in particular, and Ephesians here, uh, was the, one of the first voices to eventually abolish slavery, to actually get rid of it. Uh, and, and so, uh, this is just cool, this is just really cool to see uh, what, what, what God does here in Ephesians chapter 6. But jumping back in here, though. He says, slaves obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, uh, with a sincere, genuine heart. <clears throat> so Paul's talking to the slaves, and he's not actually saying, uh, in this passage, he's not saying, hey, look, find a way to get out. you got to buck the system, man. you got to turn that household upside down and get out of it. Now, there is another passage where Paul says, he says, if, if, if you can control it, don't become slaves. He does say that. But he doesn't say, buck the system, right? He's, he's, under, and he's actually going to go deeper with this. Because this is the Christian life where suffering is just natural. Where hurt and pain and discomfort in places I don't want to be and feelings I'm having, that's part of living in this broken and fallen world, all right? So Paul is saying through this, guys, you remember, this goes beyond. This, and this is just the Christian life. This is the Christian life where we have to say no to the flesh. We have to say no to the desires the, the, when we do want to get out and, and when our, our knee-jerk response after feeling the weight of pressure on us is to just, I'm done, I just want out. How can I jerk everything and run from responsibility? This isn't what Paul says. Paul says, like we talked about last time, get ready. I'm going to prepare you for this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the power through the Holy Spirit to walk through this pain. All right, so he says this to slaves. Guys, it goes deeper than this. It goes deeper than somebody just telling you to do things you don't want to do. Obey those earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart. saying, with, 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 with your genuine, with, with authenticity, and, and with fear and trembling, with, with a reverence. What? With a reverence for your master. Trembling. What is going on? Well, if you didn't say the last four words of verse 5, it wouldn't make sense. But he says, obey as you would Christ. And that's why you can say with fear and trembling, that's why you can say with reverence and with a sincere heart, you can do this. And this is why he's going to say, I'm not just going to give you the easy way out. All right? But I am going to tell you the Christ-honoring way through. So he says, as you would Christ, obey. And that is listen, that is hearken, that is do what he says. Do it. This is, and out of reverence, and remember last week we talked about this, uh, the, the position of a pastor, all right? So you guys don't walk in here every Sunday and be like, man, I want to be just like that. That guy is just so holy, right? When you talk about this normally being the opposite when you walk in, like, how is that guy a pastor, right? <laughs> but but there's, a, there, there, there's a, a position of pastor that, that God has ordained. All right, that, that comes with it, just a, a reference for that position. It's not me, right? I, I'm, I'm the placeholder. 
It's the position. And so, and so Paul is using that same argument here. And he's saying, this is the position this person is holding as a master. And obey it as you would Christ. Because when you obey that master, which is where God has you both, you are pulling through that master and you are actually obeying Christ. All right? So this is what I mean, too, by the biblical home must be characterized by selfless living, by selfless serving. <clears throat> The way that a servant could accomplish this was only by dying to self and running to Jesus. And, and, and I'm extrapolating it a little here. I'm going. To, we're, we're taking this a little. We're, now we're not in the first century and we're here in the 21st century. And I think what, where we can take from this as far as application goes is, is guys, we, we've got to be servants. <clears throat> There's always going to be someone above us. There's always going to be somebody who's, who, who wants, us, wants something from us, that's asking us to do things. And our mindset our mindset is going to be one of a servant. Philippians 2 kind of stuff. Just like Jesus. All right, so uh, I, I think that's something we can pull here, pull from this, where, where if we want a biblical home, that house is going to be filled with people that serve. And they're going to serve and when, when they don't want to. They're going to, be, they're going to serve when they're being asked to th do things they, they, they can't do or they, they don't want to do. All right? I think biblical homes are also going to be filled with... Um, they're not going to be filled with people pleasers. We want a biblical home. We are not going to be people that just work by way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants. All right. So if we want a biblical home, we are going to be the kind of people that that work with a sincere heart, that work genuinely. I am going to work as hard as when you're watching or when you're not. And this makes complete sense. For Paul to say this when he's he's talking to, to you know people that are enslaved who are you know it, it'll be so easy for those, those slaves to be to, to, to do just that oh man master's here I better I better scurry around look like look, look busy you guys probably know that guy at work right now or that girl at work that's just a professional like they're really good at looking busy my dad always tells a story about this guy that uh, was always just like he worked at a uh, a bus cleaning wash place. And this one guy, no one ever knew what he did except like throw a hose out. So anytime you look at him, he looked like he was unrolling a hose and throwing it somewhere and be throwing it back. And they just kind of like stopped and watched him like, that guy literally does nothing. <laughs> he's, a, he's just really good at looking busy. This is the idea here that, that this isn't just eye service where people have their eyes on you. And in a response to somebody looking at you, you're trying to, you're trying to give them this vibe that you're working really hard. I'm really going after it. I'm really digging in here. He said, that's what people pleasers do. <clears throat> Stepping on my toes here. You guys know this is a tendency of mine um, <clears throat> uh, where I just, I want to do what other people want me to do. <clears throat> if that means that I fit in this way or I look like this, I, I want to do that. But this is driving deeper. And this is going to our core as, as someone who has fundamentally given up Themselves as someone who has fundamentally died to himself. <clears throat> so I think the biblical homes are going to be filled with uh, servants. They're going to, they're not going to be filled with people pleasers. They're going to be filled with people who do the will of God. As we read through here, we'll see that it says uh, they do the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as for the Lord and not to man. For time's sake, I'm going to skip along. And, uh, I think, though, that biblical homes not just are going to be filled with people who do God's will, regardless of how hard that is. They're going to do the next right thing. Uh, I think biblical homes are going to be filled with people who, who know where their reward comes from. This is what Paul says here. Verse 7, you, you give service with a good will. All right, that comes from that genuineness, that authenticity. As to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's slave or free. The knowing here refers back to that obeying. These slaves are motivated to obey because they know that their master in heaven is going to reward them. Once again, this is where we're being, we're being pulled through the immediate situation. And God is asking us to see the master. He's asking us to see what underlies everything that we're doing. It's for something greater. It's for a, 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 a different, more holy cause. It's not just to get this over with, to just finish the task. It's, we are motivated by the God who gives. We are motivated by the God who judges. And he, he concludes it in verse 9 by saying, there's no partiality with 
this kind of God. <clears throat> so I think the biblical home is going to be characterized by several things. Respectful children, dedicated parents, selfless servants, and humble leaders. And humble leaders is the last thing. And this is where he, he takes this. Talking about slave for, for the first few verses there, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, talking to their motives, really. Trying try to make sure that slaves get their eyesight off of, of just the here and now, the immediate. Got to get this done. Got to get this weight off. Got to shed the, the, the responsibilities of, of my master. And now he's talking to the masters. He says, do the same to them. Masters, do the same to them. Stop threatening them. Do the same. What's that idea? I think this is Paul. In the same way that he told slaves to have good will, to work hard, with integrity, to be honest, in the same way that he's telling the slaves that, he is now telling the masters. And it's just this general idea of having integrity, of being dedicated to your work as a master, and showing goodwill as a master, and that that's going to be played out in the way that you, you take care of your slaves, as the servants in your household. And you too, master, you are working, you are operating, you are functioning for the Lord, as to the Lord. Then he, he gets really specific, though, here, all right? So he says, you know, uh, do the same thing. And then he says, stop, you're threatening. Man, what's the fastest way to get somebody to do something for you? You threaten them, right? I'm going to take this away from you, especially your children. Hey, if you don't do this, I'm going to do this. I'm going to ground you. I'm going to take your phone away. I'm going to put you in the corner. I'm going to whatever. <clears throat> And, 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 and I think there are there are times where you have to in a child's life you've got to you've got to play that out in a specific way, right? And you it, it's not just an empty threat. It's like we're going to do this. This is the real deal, right? So just shape it up a little bit. I think there's room for that. But what's going on here is is Paul is addressing the mindset from that angry master. He's addressing that master who just hurls these these threats to slaves. Like, Man, if you ever want freedom, you better you better work harder. If you ever went out of this house, you better do this. And he's throwing just these dumb, these dumb threats to people. And it was even common to, to, for, the, for the women to do this in, in a sensual way, where they're threatening the women. If you don't work, then things are going to happen. And, and, and where they would actually physically beat their slaves. They could verbally abuse their slaves. And, and Paul is saying, this is not the Christian way. This is not the Christian way. This is not somebody who's been redeemed. This is not how they work. This is not how they operate. Stop the threatening. Work out your dedication. Work out uh, your integrity. Let them see that. Be, work in honesty, deal in humility with these people. And just remember that God will judge. God will judge. A policeman, right, he might, might give somebody famous. Uh, he might let them buy for getting a ticket just by who they are, right? And I think, was it Michael Jordan that would drive around with signed basketballs in the back of his Porsche? <laughs> Does he get pulled over and he just offer him <laughs> signed basketball? <laughs> uh, you know, somebody might, uh, uh, someone on this earth might, might be inclined to do something like that where they are gonna be partial because of who you are or who you aren't, but not our God. And this is where Paul concludes it. And this makes a lot of sense when he says there is neither barbarian, nor Scythian, slave, nor free, but all are one in Jesus. That makes a lot more sense when we see it this way, where Paul ends this by saying, my God's not partial. So master, stop acting, part stop treating your slaves with partiality. And slaves, just work hard as to the Lord and trust your life Lord, you see how a humble, it takes humility to do that? So it takes humility to be impartial, to, to act as the lowly when you are not the lowly. The story goes, I just heard this this week, actually. The story goes of a conference that was taking place, and uh, it was about 12.30 the night before the conference. Uh, and the main speaker uh, was a well-known speaker, uh, but, but he was kind of new to this, this group of people. So anyways, it's about 12.30 at night, and they get this little knock on the door. And uh, the, the guy who, who stayed at like the parsonage uh, heard this knock on the door. He's like, what's going on? It's kind of late. You know, 
Hyatt from Frank Blue putting together this, the day before the conference. And kind of this like smaller, short guy shows up in just kind of normal looking clothing. Um, nothing fancy at all. He'd be like had a little tiny bag with him. <clears throat> guy lets him in and um, he says, hey, uh, we don't have anywhere to put you, so uh, you know, you can come stay with the interns, essentially. Come, come stay with the interns. So he, he brings him in and he's like, oh, have you eaten? He's like, oh, no, I haven't eaten. So he grabs him some cereal, with, like some porridge, pretty much for this guy, like the lowliest of food you can offer to someone that's, I mean, for sake of illustration, following. And the guy eats this, you know, there, there was no, there was no steak dinner, and he just eats this, this kind of simple cereal, and then he, he, he says, hey, I'm sorry, we don't have space for you, so, so here, I'll, I'll, I'll put this, a couple, uh, you know, things of padding down, I'll put some sheets down for you on the floor, but that's the best I got right now. <clears throat> the next day at the, uh, the conference, that man who, who let, let the visitor in is sitting there, and he sees that small, simple man walk to the front and start speaking. It was the headliner. It was the main speaker. His name was Francis Schaefer. He was a big deal. And this, this is crazy to see the humility that it took this guy. If you guys know Schaefer, I mean, his, his thinking, his books, his, his philosophy has, has really shaped millions of people and Christians alike. Uh, Christian. Uh, and this guy humbly humbly walks in and just says, I'm a nobody. I don't need better treatment than you. Man, we all kneel before the same Jesus. Do you guys see the importance of Jesus being the center of your home, though? It affects every single one of our relationships. So my challenge to us is, that, that, is to foster an atmosphere of this kind of biblical household where uh, you know our world, our society, it desperately needs respectful, loving children. It desperately needs dedicated parents, dedicated to the mission of, of God. We desperately need selfless servants, and we need humble leaders, guys. So let's be those people. Let's start with me. Uh, and let's make Jesus central to our lives. Father, thanks so much for your word. Thank you for changing us through it, for enlightening our eyes to it. I ask that you would. Take us deep into this truth that you would make us more and more like Jesus. Uh, Lord, would grace and love just be so evident in our lives. Uh, Lord, uh, I don't say if, but uh, Lord, those of us who are struggling to give you everything, Lord, would you just bring us to the mat? Uh, and Lord, would you, uh, would you win our hearts <laughs> uh, in a practical way? Would we give every cavity and every uh, known and unknown part of our hearts to you? So God, we give this to you. Help us not to be the too busy dad or mom, the too career-oriented dad or mom, but Lord, we be people that are centered on you and who own your mission for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. You guys are dismissed.